Uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks so much um, for having me here today. First off, uh, a, a big, big shout out to the Data Art team for the invitation. Everybody here thinks they, they know how to, how to make a startup successful. Maybe you can raise your hand if you think that's the case. The Data Art team, that's it. Nobody, nobody else knows. Um, all right, a couple more. I think a couple more. All right, good. I, I think everybody should um, should have their hand up. I, I kind of say it's like the question of, um, do you know how to be a good parent? Anybody here think they know how to be a good parent? Kind of. Um, I, I've got three kids. I got I got three young kids, and and I kind of when I was asked to give this presentation about what does it take to make a startup successful, I kind of said it's like the same thing as asking what does it take to be a successful parent. I think everybody has their own views and opinions on what it takes, and and certainly there's no shortage of people who want to give you guidance on how to be a good parent and how to run a good startup. Um, but I think one of the, the key takeaways for today is for you to think there is no right or wrong. There is no playbook. I don't even think there's a best in class way to do this. What I want to do today is share kind of what has worked for me, what my experience has been, and then maybe hopefully you'll leave with a, a couple of nuggets. Um, I really want you to think, man, that, that guy had a couple of nuggets that I walked away with that I can take and bring to my business. Just a little bit on... Uh, today's agenda, who I am, what able to is, I've got to spend at least a minute explaining the able to solution or I'll get fired. Um, but then I want to highlight what I think the successful straight, success, the common traits of successful startups look like. I'm going to highlight some points of where I see other companies going wrong. Uh, and then, and this is something I love and one of those tangible takeaways for you to have really a, a framework for successful decision making um, in any business idea. Just a little bit about who I am and, and why I think it's, it's relevant for this conversation. Um, not because I'm smarter than anybody else or work harder than anybody else or even have um, you know, better, grander ideas than anybody else, but really for one simple fact. Um, I've been on both sides of the table, right? So I've spent a long time in the managed care space meeting with entrepreneurs from across the spectrum. And, and over those years, probably met with 100 different prospects um, looking to do business with a large health insurance company and, and really kind of holding the keys to the kingdom, right? It's an incredibly, you don't, you don't realize it when you're on that side, but it's an incredibly powerful tool um, to be able to make decisions with young businesses about whether you want to bring that offering to your customers or not. And then one of those businesses, one of the 100 that I, that I um, met with when I was on the plan side, I liked so much um, that not only did I bring them into my organization as a customer, I then went and led an, a direct equity investment in that business. Um, and then I said, you know what, I've been inspired by entrepreneurs my entire career. I don't want to work for a large organization anymore. I really want to go um, help an organization scale. Um, and so I went and joined that, that same company, right? So I've been at Able to now for about a year. And I'll, I'll go a little bit deeper into who Able to is. Um, if, if you've never heard of Able to, we're a, a tech-enabled behavioral health provider. We've been treating patients for about six years now. We're located you know, down, the, down the street on 37th Street. What we do, which I think is just really, really interesting, is focus on combining behavioral health care with medical health care, right? And if you're not deep in that space, what you, you might not realize is insurance companies have forever, not forever, but for 30 years, literally carved out behavioral health and said, if people have a behavioral health condition, we're literally going to carve them out of our risk and move that population over here and pay somebody else to manage it. Um, it's only recently that um, companies and insurance companies are starting to realize that Treating behavioral health over here and medical health over here makes no sense. You've got to bring that level of care together. So what able to does is it focuses on improving the health outcomes through our evidence-based, highly structured programs. What I say is not proprietary for able to is the actual care we deliver. What's proprietary is how we deliver it and the highly structured nature and the fact that we're able to produce outcomes, right? So if you think about therapy today, it's kind of like a black box. 
right? You, you might go once, you might go 100 times, you might get better, you might not. We've taken that traditional therapy and have turned it into Legos, right? Replaceable, repeatable blocks that you can customize based on that individual's needs, and you can follow instructions and know what the output on the other side is gonna look like. Um, we've got very deep population health capabilities to help manage that population and really integrate back with our health plan partners. Um, we've got some real blue chip clients, which was, again, one of the reasons why I chose to join ABLE2 um, when I did, but Aetna, United, Costco, Horizon, um, and many others. Um, and it's really because of that last line, our proven ROI um, that we've done at scale, where we have published studies with some of our plan partners, um, all while achieving a 97% member satisfaction score, right? So we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Now, I, I call this kind of the, the throwaway slide, right? What are the common traits of successful startups? And I don't think there's anything in here um, that's gonna be shocking to anyone, right? It, you, what do you need or what do all successful startups have? They're gonna have an idea that makes sense and is meeting the needs of a market. This, this one is you know, the, it, obvious, right? The team to execute on that vision. I think a lot of times you'll have conflicting points of view on, on what's more important, the idea or the team. And I think the common response is that a great idea with a lousy team won't work and an amazing team with a lousy idea won't work. I think obviously you're gonna need both of those. Um, when I made decisions on the plan side and the answer was no, and the answer was no much more often for me, it was usually this third one, this solid business model and funding secured. Funding secured, I think is the relatively easy part, right? If, if, if you're willing, there's lots and lots and lots of people out there who will give you money. Um, but the business model to me, it was shocking, just absolutely shocking how many times I would sit with an early stage company who would have this amazing idea and they would finish and I would say, like, who pays who? Like, do I pay you? Do you pay me? Do, does the member pay? Does the physician pay? Right, and that happens so often. And if I couldn't understand how the money flowed, the answer was always no, right? And I, I mean, I'm an, I'm an accountant by trade. I actually started at, at Deloitte, right? I'm, I was a CPA in their audit practice, right? And if I can't, simply understand how the money's gonna flow here, the answer for me was always, always no. Some people have that approach of, well, we'll figure it out later, we'll figure out how we make money later, um, and for me, that was, that was always a, a big red flag. Now, this last one is, is when I highlight on the bottom that not all, not all of these traits are really weighted equally, and I think you, you can't underestimate the, the importance of the last one, the timing. You can have an incredible idea, you can have an amazing team and a business model that makes sense, but if the market isn't ready for it, it's not gonna work, right? And you, there's lots and lots and lots of different examples. You know, an, an easy one to kind of put your head around, it's a little dated at this point, but there were a lot of companies that had the same exact idea as YouTube, right? But they were out before most Americans had broadband internet in their house, right? So it doesn't matter how great the idea was, if people don't have access to the product, it's not gonna work. I'm gonna, I'm gonna call out Able to a little bit on this one. I think our growth was slower in the early years in large part because we were ahead of the market, right? Behavioral health right now is, is kind of hot, especially in the venture space. There's a lot of money being thrown into behavioral health. We were founded in 2008, right? We went three years before we started treating patients. Back in 2008, nobody was thinking about behavioral health, right? You'd have a couple of these visionaries, usually a psychiatrist within a health plan who might want to do something to you, but the market was not talking about behavioral health. The opioid crisis wasn't there yet in 2008. This, this number of celebrities talking about their own depression, their own challenges wasn't there back in 2008, right? So the 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 Timing is absolutely a, a critical element that, that most often gets overlooked. Now, this is, this is my favorite slide, and, and 
anybody who knows me or who has worked with me in the past um, knows that I love to express ideas in the forms of continuums, right? That there are almost never black and white answers, right? Especially when you work in strategy and business development, right? The answer is almost never yes or no, but some shade of gradation in the middle. Um, my, my key takeaway for you guys here is not to, to pick a position that you're gonna be on one end of the left or the other end on the right or even somewhere in the middle. My takeaway for you here is to be deliberate in your decision making and make decisions about philosophically where you fall on this continuum. I'm gonna walk through each one uh, for a minute or two. Right, there's two distinct chains of, uh, uh, chains of thought here, right? Do you listen to the market or do you stay true to your vision? Right, what you're gonna see is some startups pick one, some startups pick the other. The, uh, some are gonna have this marquee client um, or a handful of conversations at place like, places like this and let that inform all of their key decision making. There are others who are gonna think they're smarter than everybody else and seize the market before it gets there, right? And they're gonna stay true to that vision, unable to pivot, right? It's obviously important to know where you fall there. Um, next one, speed is everything versus steady pacing. Um, this, even internally within Able2, who's, who's not technically a, a, I don't know when you're officially not a startup anymore. Is there a threshold? Does anybody know? Three years, so we're not a startup anymore. So when you're profitable, right, when you can stand on your own, I, I, I think there's, there's lots of different um, uh, ways to slice it, right? But there's always going to be this choice of being first to market, right, first mover advantage versus steady pacing, right, like not going out to market until your product's are actually ready, right? And we still deal with that, right? Even though we've been serving patients for about six years now, um, especially in the product development world, right? There's, there's a notion to rush, 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 right? Especially when you talk to product people. And then I kind of sometimes raise my hand and say, well, how, how are we gonna get paid for this? Like we need to change our contracts to make sure we're getting reimbursed for these new offerings, not just worry about being first to market. This third one, is um, uh, you know, I, I'll, I have a strong opinion on where to fall on this third one, but it, I'd love to hear uh, from others in the room. When I uh, was on the plan side, right, I had been there at that point in, in the, the health plan side for 12 years um, and felt like I knew the business really well, right? Even though 12 years in health plan speak, sometimes you feel like you only know this much. Um, but I felt like I had a really strong domain expertise in health plans, how to get reimbursed from health, health plans, how to contract with health plans, right? How to, how to message your value proposition to health plans. I thought that was like a real core competency of mine that I could bring to the startup community. And when I was talking to a lot of people in the startup world, it w there were some who kind of had the opinion, well, you're part of the problem, right? Like, we don't want health plan people on our team because you're the reason the system's been so broken for 80 or 90 years. It's like, okay, right? Like, obviously, I'm not a good cultural fit for your organization, right? And then I think there's, there's kind of the, the opposite side, which are businesses that are hiring health plan execs left and right to be their COO, to be their CFO, right? That understanding that you absolutely, this, business, especially if you have any interest at all in touching a, a Medicare or a Medicaid patient, that that domain expertise is so critical um, that we need two, three, five senior executives at that level who really have deep plan experience. Uh, again, not a right or wrong answer, but very important that you have an opinion on, the, on that, that question. Um, again, land and expand versus death by pilot. Um, depending on where you are in your organization's life, right? Obviously, if you don't have any customers yet, the notion of a pilot, any pilot, no matter how small, if it means you're getting money from a customer, is amazing, 
right? You've finally broken through, you've got a contract, you've got somebody who's willing to pay bills, um, and you're able to hopefully get to the point where you're not a startup anymore. But then there comes a point, right, when pilot, or the word pilot, becomes a, a dirty word within your organization, right? And when do you have enough of a business, enough evidence, enough support and belief behind your business model that you're going to be willing to turn away business because they want to start small as a pilot and grow and expand. Right? For a business like Able to, our operating costs to get a new client up and running are essentially the same whether we're treating two patients or we're treating thousands of patients. Right, So we need to be extremely deliberate about who we choose to work with um, and, and the ability to say no if we don't think it's the right idea for us. Right? Very, very difficult to do. The last one, and, and interesting, you know, a little bit of inside information. This is probably the one where my boss, our CEO, Rob Reback, and I um, disagree the most um, and have the most spirited discussions around. Right? He's, Maybe I wouldn't call him paranoid about competition, right? But he is certainly very mindful of what our competitors are doing. And we're in that weird space, probably like a lot of you. We don't really have direct competitors. We don't have anybody doing exactly what we do. We have, we have other organizations trying to solve the behavioral health problem, um, doing it in a different way. And their competitors in that we're competing for mind share at health plans. But we do different things. We solve different problems. Um, and, and he is, is relentlessly focused on how are our competitors adapting their models, how are they getting in with the same plans that we want to get in with. Right? And I, I probably fall a little bit too far on the other side of the spectrum, kind of using the belief of, like, I don't really care what anybody else is doing. I know what we do works. I know we're having success in the market, and if we keep executing at the level we're executing on, it doesn't matter, right? There's that great picture. I actually put it in here, and then I, I took it out just because it didn't look that nice. But from the Olympics, where Michael Phelps was swimming, I don't know if anybody saw that, right? And the guy who's in second place is in the lane next to him looking over at Michael Phelps. I don't know if anybody saw that, right? And the quote is, winners focus on winning, and losers focus on winners, Right? And that's kind of my mentality here, is I'm not so worried about what's happening in the market. As long as we keep executing, we'll be OK. And I, that WTF in there is not a, a typo. That's like my favorite mantra that I use around the office constantly. Um, and it means win through focus. Right? It means focus on, on what we do well. Let's not get distracted by every shiny object that gets put in front of us. Focus on doing what we do well, um, and, and, and good things will happen. Any questions there before I move on? OK. Now, um, to me, th this is the lens through which I made every decision when I was on the plan side. And, and if you've been pitching to health plans um, with limited success, um, there's, there might be a simple reason for that, right? This is something called the triple aim, which if you've been deep in the healthcare space for a while, the triple aim is not a new term, right? It's been around for 15 years or so. Um, it's actually evolving into a quadruple aim, but, but health plans right now are really thinking about the triple aim um, and making every decision while answering the question of, are we achieving the triple aim? That triple aim is a better patient experience, an improved quality of care, and a hard ROI. I can tell you, years ago, I sat on a committee in a health plan that made decisions about vendors that we were going to partner with. And the conversation used to go something like this. Um, we know our patients are going to hate this, or our members are going to hate this. Right, it's going to disrupt their care. Right, there's going to be other kinds of problems that it creates. They're going to have to jump through these extra hurdles. Um, but we're going to save a lot of money, and it's not going to make their care worse. It's just going to make an administrative burden upon them. All right, and we would measure. We would literally measure the disruption that it would cause, and how many extra phone calls are we going to get because we're going to have pissed off members. 
right, we would have those conversations and we'd have to make a trade-off and say, is the financial value that's, that accrues to our business by creating this disruption going to be worth those extra phone calls? And we could even put a dollar value on those phone calls, right, and a dollar value on the number of members that we thought were going to leave, right? We could do that. Um, that day is over, right? That day is absolutely over. Health plans are making every decision now around we need to provide a better patient experience, we need to improve the quality of care for our members, and it has to cost less, right? And if you can achieve those three, you'll have great success in, in painting that value proposition to your plans. I, I might, I mean, if I were really thinking through, might change that hard ROI line um, a little bit to say something like, um, cost less, right, or not cost more. If you can provide outstanding service and, and get people better and have it not cost more, right, that's a win, right? But if you're, if you're delighting the patient and, and getting that patient a lot better, but it's adding to the total cost of care, not interested, right, not interested. Any questions there on the triple aim? Yeah, so the, the quadruple aim is, is not that new of a term either. Don Berwick um, it, from the IHI uh, actually created the triple aim and, and has also created the quadruple aim. The quadruple aim's focus, that fourth circle, is the provider experience, right? So if you read about um, provider burnout these days, right, and if you've waited in an uh, a hospital waiting room for an hour and a half to be seen because they've got 35 patients they've got to get through on their panel that day, right? It, it's, it's not a great time uh, to be a clinician today based on any measurable metric out there. Um, so the, the quadruple aim, and if we're really going to change the system for, for the good, you've got to improve the physician experience or the nurse experience, right? So that's the, the quadruple aim. It doesn't have as much traction yet as the triple aim, but it will, definitely will. Okay, um, now this, this for me is a, a key takeaway that I would love for you all to really think about and digest. And I didn't make this up. I actually learned it in a, in a presentation just like this several years ago. And I actually went back to the office and printed this, this one formula out and gave it to all my, my staff at the time because I thought it was really so impactful. And I thought we had fallen victim to, to not thinking about this formula. Um, I, I, you know, headed, I, I gave the heading of how can you design a strategy that works. Um, it's called a lot of different things, the change acceptance formula, right, likelihood of success formula. There's all different things that you can call it, but you really got to think about each element. Um, the first is the Q, right, the quality of your solution multiplied times the market acceptance of that solution. When you put those two factors together, you'll calculate the likelihood of success in your strategy, right? And this doesn't just apply towards leading an early stage business um, or running strategy even at a larger organization. You could apply this to like every decision you make in your life, like trying to get your kids to do something they don't want to do right, or, or negotiating to buy a house, right, there are all different lenses through which you can think about this formula. Um, but the, the key in this is the, the multiplier in the middle, right, that it's Q times A. And what I mean by that, and where most people fall wrong, is they're always focused on the Q, right? They are always focused on the solution itself, right? Building the better mousetrap right, or, or hiring the best, you know, analytics folks to build the most sophisticated algorithms, right, they are relentlessly focused on driving up the value of the Q, right, and let's say on a scale of one to 10, your Q, the quality of your solution, it's a 10 out of a 10, right, but if you've spent zero time thinking about how that solution will be accepted by the market, and the market's not looking for that solution, and your, your A is a zero, right? 10 times zero equals zero, 
right? You will not be successful with that solution no matter how amazing it is. Meanwhile, you can have a solution that's okay, right? It's pretty good, right? It's, it's maybe not where you'd want it to be if you had another 18 months to develop it, right? But it's good. Um, and you've done an amazing job building out acceptance for that solution, helping your partners recognize the need, right? If your solution is a five, right, it's halfway there, but your acceptance is also a five, you've done a good job or decent job building up that, that acceptance, right? Five times five obviously equals 25. Sure. Yeah. If you want to use the microphone. Hello. Um, usually people have two opposite views on what I see as market acceptance, as you put it. Some say, don't go talk about your solution until you have the quality 10 out of 10, yeah. because people might copy. Or others say, don't worry about that and just go for that first and <laughs> have a minimal viable product. So there are two different philosophies. Yeah. What do you think about that? It, uh, it's a, a a really excellent question, um, and I don't know what the right answer is. I really don't, right? And and I think there are two completely different points of view. And and I'm gonna I'm gonna use Able to as as a real life case study, right? Um, we were built kind of from the ground up by clinicians, right? By experts in science, by experts in data measurement and management right, and proving outcomes. And we spent a long time um, and an amazing amount of effort building out our solution, right, I th to, the, to the detriment of really being laser focused on selling, right, and capitalizing on the value that we're creating, right, and being out in front of the market, building out the brand, right. I think we were, we were very heavy on the queue and very light on the A, right? There's the exact flip side of that, right? There are a lot of solutions being pointed at behavioral health today um, because the market is so hot in behavioral health who are, who are absolutely being amazing advocates for change, right? They're positioning themselves as leaders in behavioral health, right? And they have an idea of how to solve that problem. But meanwhile, the solution's not there yet, right? They're kind of, I say, laying the tracks while the train's already moving, right? Or building the engine while the plane's in the air, however, however you want to say it. And maybe they'll figure it out, but maybe they won't. I can tell you for me personally, when I was making the decision of, of where to leave, right? When I decided I wanted to leave a big company and go early, um, I thought about this formula and, and me thinking about able to is having this amazing clinical program and being kind of weak on the acceptance side, I thought like that's an easy problem to solve, right? Like I can solve that problem. Um, whereas if, you're, if you've already done a great job building acceptance in the market, but the, prob the, the solution's kind of on a bed of clay, like I can't solve that problem, right? And so. I would tend to say focus on the Q slightly more than the A, um, but one or the other isn't going to work. Any other questions on the, so, sure. Hi, I'm Sabrina from Nemedio. I have a question about um, metrics on the market acceptance of your solution. From a product standpoint, the quality is kind of easier to figure out how many, you could do beta testing, you can do surveys. What type of metrics might you use other than I have 20 clients right now to uh, measure the market acceptance? Yeah, that, you know, I wish I had a better answer for you. Um, and, and I don't, right? And, and I wish I, I, wish I um, could tell you that I've got, you know, an Excel model on my desk where I think about this um, framework on every decision that I make. The reality is it's, it's a, it's a, tool to help you pause and think, you know, before you make strategic decisions. Um, I think there are some soft metrics, like you said, how rich is your pipeline? How far along are your prospects? Um, how much competition is coming into this space trying to solve the problem? Like, for example, in behavioral health today, 
Um, you know, there's, there's, an, there's 10 articles every day on reducing the stigma for BH treatment, right? There's a lot of noise in the market. But to say, okay, we can slot it from a seven to an eight, it, it's not that precise. In the back, yeah. Very quickly, one good uh, metric on market acceptance is repeat business. Yeah, that's great. Sure. Um, it's really hard, right? It's really hard. I think we've, we've got an amazing guy, John Pella here in, in the, in the back, um, who has just done an absolutely, um, outstanding job kind of increasing able to's brand recognition. Um, the, the number of invitations we get to events like this to speak has gone from, you know, very little to a ton, right? Where we've got to more often than not say no. Um, and a really, um, uh, I'll give away an idea we had that was just outstanding, it, kind of two ideas. They're piggybacked on the same thing. When I started along with our, our CEO last year together, we went on a nationwide uh, learning tour, right, where we were able to get, b based on our relationships, into C-suite level offices with um, uh, most health, all of the large health plans, a lot of the regional blues, all of the big brokers, several large employers, right? And we didn't go there as an able to pitch. We went there as we're here to learn, right? How are you thinking about your behavioral health strategy? So obviously helping elevate us as thought leaders. We're very, very interested in being seen as thought leaders, not just a vendor. Um, then we actually took all of those learnings and hosted a behavioral health summit here at the Harvard Club last October where we had David Shulkin, the, the head of the VA, as our guest speaker, right, who, who we didn't pay, right? He came for free because he wanted to be part of addressing this solution, right? So kind of being seen as thought leaders within our plan partners, um, and then, you know, hosting an event where we had the first lady of the city of New York and the head of the VA um, and others really, I think, took the Able To brand to another level. Am I doing okay on time, Dan? Uh, any more questions back here? Hi, I'm Will Treichler. I'm curious, as you guys have started to scale, it sounds like the acceptance part of the equation has improved. Um, what is the kind of dynamic relationship in terms of like, you know, I look at it through the lens a little bit of um, uh, software development, the term agile gets thrown around a lot. Um, do you guys see a similar relationship between the quality of the solution, market acceptance, one supporting the other, like kind of dynamically over time? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, there's a couple of ways I could answer that question. I think as we scale, the focus on quality um, has to remain paramount in everything that we do, right? Because we are measured on our outcomes, right? We've, we've gone to health plans and say, if you hire us as providers in your network, we will treat this cohort of patients and deliver on X results in clinical improvements and lower total cost of care. If, if as we continue to scale and see more and more patients, it erodes the value that we're creating and we measure every step along the way, um, it just, it won't work, right? Like we won't be in business anymore. So um, that focus hasn't changed. If anything, it's, it's intensified. And uh, there were a couple other questions over here. All right, hang on a sec, sir. So uh, I don't know how many of you guys are Health 2.0 members. Uh, so if you are, you know this role. Introduce yourself, say where you're from, and then speak into the mic. Thanks. Hi, John Lockney from Commonwealth Care Alliance. Um, could you speak a little bit about pilots for both being the payer and now the startup, about duration and how you think about them? Yeah. Um, the obvious answer would be as a plan side, I love them, and as the the – partner side, I hate them, but I don't think that's totally true. From the plan side, um, I didn't love pilots either because it was a lot of work for me to get these pilots up and running, right? I still have to go through the data security audits, right? I still have to worry about HIPAA compliance. I still have to do all that same stuff from the plan side, whether you're a pilot or a full, you know, the, the, the IT audit looks the same, whether you're a nationwide rollout or focused in you know, Albuquerque. Um, so I didn't love, I didn't love pilots on that side either. What I loved 
And this is where I think a lot of people in health startups probably don't recognize. What I loved from the plan side was limiting my risk, right? That's what I did. I limited my risk. And I, what I love was bumpers or guardrails, right? And to say it's not a pilot, right? It can be a full-scale rollout, but the program in the early years is going to look like this. And at worst, if this whole thing blew up, what happens to me? I want to have little risk, right? So structuring your contracts in a way that your risk is limited was the number one thing for me. I think a lot of times companies would pitch to me and I, I wouldn't have a sense of exactly what's at stake. Like, I don't know what really good looks like and I don't know what really bad looks like. And so what we've done, especially at Able to over the last years, we've gotten really good about putting those guardrails in place and saying that, look, even if this thing goes completely off the rails, here's how you're exposed. And as a health plan side, if that number was small, I'm good, right? We can go big. We can go national rollout, right? As long as I know what my downside exposure is. Does that make sense? So, so that's, that's it. I, I obviously can stand up here and talk all day. Hopefully you found that helpful again. Um, hopefully that you can just take a couple of nuggets on what has worked for me. Uh, I'm going to be here for the rest of the day. Happy to talk uh, over lunch or early in the afternoon. So thanks so much.